A little bit about uh, Digital Bond Labs. Uh, we're a new division of a company called Digital Bond. Uh, Digital Bond has been doing uh, industrial control system and SCADA consulting for uh, going on 14 years now uh, as its sole practice. Uh, our part of Digital Bond, though, is focused on working with vendors to find new vulnerabilities and new bugs uh, in industrial products and fix those bugs before they become problems for end users. Um, so that be, since I um, work for Digital Bond Labs and do that sort of testing, uh, I'm a big advocate of red teams, so I have a bit of bias there. Uh, but I say for a vendor, hire any outside team or start your own internal team for doing uh, testing for vulnerabilities like what I'll talk about today. Uh, so this is kind of the outline of our talk. Uh, I unfortunately have to define vulnerability. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, inheritance that uh, we, we inherit, how we inherit vulnerabilities from third party libraries. Uh, go over, uh, I guess one example, but it sort of is two examples of uh, vulnerability that uh, exists in programmable logic controllers. Look at a few affected vendors and finally talk about uh, what can be done. Um, so vulnerability, uh, it's a strange word in the industrial space uh, because of ICS CERT. Uh, ICS CERT is the Industrial Control Systems uh, Computer Emergency Response Team. They're based in the United States uh, at Idaho National Labs. Um, they unfortunately said vulnerabilities do not include uh, insecure by design features of a product. So if something has no security built into its protocol, ICS CERT decided they're not going to call that a vulnerability. They've backtracked from that definition a little bit, uh, but not much. Um, my definition, though, is uh, a vulnerability is any mechanism that lets you do something with a system that was not intended. Um, so that includes traditional bugs, like actually bypassing authentication and buffer overflows that allow code execution. But um, uh, you know, also includes these insecure by design issues where there was no authentication in the system to begin with. Um, so third-party libraries. Uh, in the embedded world, third-party libraries are a lot of things in the firmware. Um, they would be any embedded operating system. Um, you know, VxWorks is a very common one. Uh, Linux runs on a lot of embedded systems, even Windows CE. Uh, these embedded web servers that sit in, in devices uh, are also common third-party libraries. And then we have libraries themselves, like OpenSSL. And of course, there's these external utilities, like Bash, that have been in the news the last two years, uh, having a lot of vulnerabilities in them. But then there are some specialized industrial libraries, and that's really what I'm talking about today. Uh, and two that I've been looking at for the last two or three years have been uh, Codesys and Proconos. And these are two libraries that are made by different companies in Germany um, that have a lot of, uh, of market penetration here in Europe. Um, so the real issue with these third-party libraries, of course, is ownership, right? So if you're a vendor and you're incorporating you know, these, these outside operating systems, these outside libraries into your product, uh, now you own the problem that happens in that library. So uh, um, because your, your end users can't update the library themselves, they depend on you to build a firmware for them. Um, so, you know, for example, Windows CE might have some vulnerabilities uh, in it, uh, and in fact, it has had quite a few over the years. Um, the question is, you know, as, as a vendor, will the vendor, you know, keep track of the bugs as Microsoft uh, issues security advisories? Will they produce a new firmware, uh, and will they tell their customers about the new firmware version and, uh, you know, provide easy tools for the customer to patch? Um, so. For the ICS world, um, Codesys is a PLC uh, ladder logic runtime. So uh, Codesys uh, has a couple of different software components, but the main one that I look at is what actually runs on a logic controller. So a logic controller is a small computer that has uh, input and outputs. Uh, so it monitors processes via inputs, and then it controls processes via outputs. Um, essentially a computer that just uh, runs uh, process logic. Um, so the Codesys uh, software is used by, uh, I think it was 280 vendors. Uh, so you know, 280 different companies use this library in their in their hardware. And uh, uh, primarily, the the vendors that use this software are in Europe. Uh, they have made some inroads into Japan, uh, also in the USA. 
Um, so Codasys, uh, 3S Software is the company that makes the Codasys software. Um, they uh, used to have a list of all of their uh, end vendors, so a list of all the companies that used Codasys in their products. They took that down when we released vulnerability information about the Codasys library. Uh, thankfully, there's archive.org, the internet wayback machine, so you can still get the list of vendors from there. Uh, these are some select vendors, you know, names that I recognize uh, or that I think are pretty common in the industrial space. Um, of people who are running Codasys on their, their industrial equipment. Um, so the Codasys, uh, like I said, it, the main part of it that I look at is the PLC ladder logic runtime. Uh, that uh, ladder logic runtime is designed to run on top of VXWorks, Windows CE, Linux. There's also uh, an RTOS called Nucleus RTOS that uh, I've seen a lot of these, uh, these controllers running. Um, executes ladder logic, uh, and it also has a listening service that uh, provides communications for sending status updates and receiving commands from operators in the industrial space. Um, but it's not just the software on the PLC, there's also engineering software. So there's a nice GUI, it looks kind of like Visual Studio um, for uh, programming ladder logic. So the idea here is that a vendor um, doesn't uh, have to spend a lot of time programming that GUI themselves. They can just use the one that Codasys provides. Uh, supports a bunch of different programming languages for ladder logic. Um, and then they have uh, also an OPC server, that's OLE for process control, just uh, basically a communication server for getting data out of the controller and presenting it in an easy manner for process control people. And then they also have an optional gateway server. So if the PLC is sitting on a hard to reach network, um, maybe you want to restrict firewall rules somehow, you can communicate with the PLC over this gateway server. Um, so this is kind of uh, how the, the Codasys portions interact with each other. Like this is the main PLC that runs the ladder logic runtime, but then you have an HMI that may talk to the PLC directly or it may talk to the gateway server. You have an, H, an engineering workstation that may talk to the PLC directly or might talk to the uh, gateway server. Some PLCs have built-in web applications, so the HMI might actually be speaking HTTP to the web application, and then the web application on the back end speaks the Codasys protocol to the, uh, to the PLC itself. Um, so there's a lot of different parts to the, the Codasys environment um, that make it, unfortunately, difficult to fix. Um, so the Codasys version 2 protocol, uh, we looked at this uh, back in 2012, um, and uh, found big issues. Uh, and then the Codasys version 3 protocol is a lot different from version 2, um, but it has all the same vulnerabilities as version 2. Um, and we looked at that in September of 2014. Uh, so we released some tools publicly for testing the version 2 of the protocol. We haven't released tools uh, yet for the version 3. Um, so the problems with Codasys version 2. Um, so it lets you upload process control logic to the PLC with no authentication. Um, so it means that uh, if you can talk to the PLC, you can reprogram the controller and you can affect how process is controlled. It's quite nice. Um, the, the, there's also a command line that's supported by the protocol that doesn't have authentication on it. Um, it's meant to help you debug the uh, process uh, control application that you developed. Uh, via that command line and a couple of different ways, you can issue start and stop commands to the, the PLC to very quickly uh, take a process offline. Um, there's a way to retrieve and send files via this protocol. Uh, that that uh, way of sending retrie and retrieving files is also unauthenticated and has directory traversal. Um, so uh, you, you basically, uh, the ladder logic file itself, which I'll talk about more, um, is executable code uh, for the, P, the, the processor and the PLC, so you, um, usually it runs with high privileges, so you basically get the ability to send a rootkit to the device for free. Um, and then there were a lot of these systems we were finding that are directly connected to the internet with no firewall uh, in front of them. Um, so if you want to look up ICS cert advisories and uh, you know, the, the CVEs for this, you can find them. They all have CVSS score of 10 because they're you know, no authentication, uh, network access, and root privileges, basically. 
Um, so the Codasys version three flaws are all the same. Uh, we have unauthenticated process control, upload, download. Uh, we have an unauthenticated command line. We have the ability to start and stop process control. I didn't test it for directory traversal, actually. So I, th I think it's probably going to be there. But <laughs> uh, I just say quite likely. Um, I think the rootkit deployment will also work. Uh, we, do, we did develop a rootkit for version 2 for one PLC. Um, I haven't done it for version 3 yet, but uh, maybe I will someday. That scanning for these on the internet actually turns out to be a lot more difficult. Um, but uh, so the Codasys uh, kind of deployment issue is that the usually the um, when people run this uh, ladder logic runtime on an embedded controller, they run it with really high privileges. Um, usually, it's running as root if it's a, a Linux system, or a system if it's a Windows CE system, and if it's VXWorks or one of those embedded uh, RTOSs, you know, they, they usually don't do any kind of privilege separation between processes. So, uh, there's there's nothing to be helped there. Um, but the reason for this is the the developers uh, well. Codasys has to interact with hardware, so it needs to be able to toggle uh, output contacts and things like that. Um, and it's usually just the easiest way to do it is to run it with administration privileges. Um, it, to me, it's just a symptom of rushed development that you know nobody took the time to say, okay, what privileges does this really need, and how can we, you know, code this defensively. Um, uh, and of course, the you know thing that gets me on my knees screaming why is um, the because code assist, because of the way it works, um, uh, when you write a ladder logic file, really it's just a binary blob of executable code. So now if you upload that to the PLC, uh, now it's gonna be running with root privileges or system privileges. Uh, so literally the process just takes that binary blob, copies it into memory, and then jumps into memory and begins executing what you uploaded. Um, so really, there's no security, right? That, that's, that's basically the summary of the problems. Uh, the original vendor, which is 3S Software, uh, they, they might have assumed that nobody would figure out how the protocol worked, right? That's probably what they assumed. Um, they, they've said, uh, you know, security is not our problem. Uh, that's not what we do. Uh, they actually published something to that effect in one of the security advisories they put out. You know, we, we, we don't expect that our protocol will ever be secure from attackers. Um, so, you know, and it's pretty likely they never had a red team look at this, this software ever, because if they did, the red team would have kicked and screamed and said, this is bad. Um, for the version two protocol, it's really simple. Um, you can download scripts from our website if you look us up, just digital bond, code assist, you know, you'll find the scripts there. Um, it has two, two start bytes, there are BB, BB, or CCCC, then there's a length field. The length field is actually, uh, Endian messed up. So if it's a little Endian controller, the length field will be little Endian, and if it's a big Endian controller, the length field will be big Endian, and you have to tell the PC software what Endianness your PLC is. It's pretty goofy. Um, but then, you know, after the length field, there's a function code, uh, and then there's arguments following that. Um, uh, the version two protocol usually uses TCP port 1200 or 2455. Uh, on a few of the vendors, they use a custom port. Um, uh, determining how the protocol worked was pretty easy. You know, you just do some, some analysis of PCAPs uh, and look for, I mean, the protocol is very chatty, but if you look for the unique packets, you find, uh, you know, what's causing a particular command to be sent pretty quickly. Um, so in version two, 3S software did include password protection, um, but the password protection was not enforced on the PLC. Uh, originally, it was enforced on the PC software. PC software would ask you to enter a password, you would type in the password, it would query the PLC and say, hey, is this password right? And the PLC would say yes or no, and then it would you know, pop up a, a message box saying you were right or you were wrong. Um, but the PLC didn't actually care if you tried the authentication thing first. It would just accept the, you know, the unauthenticated commands regardless of whether you tried to guess the right password or even if you got it wrong. Um, so, the, you know, this is one of the classic examples of uh, authentication in the client. Um, so, uh, 3S Software did patch the, the runtime uh, for version 2 to now add a security mechanism. But remember what I was saying before about vendors need to be aware of the, the security patch and they need to build a new firmware image. Um, to date, there is only one PLC that I have found on the internet that uh, actually has that patch included in it. 
um, and it's made by the Wago Corporation, so I always like to, to uh, point out when somebody's doing something good. Although some of Wago's brand new PLCs don't have the patch, so I don't know what's really going on with them. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I've heard that a lot of the, uh, vendors aren't producing patches for their PLCs is just because uh, there's all that other software on the network that now has to be aware of you know, sending the password to the PLC first, uh, like the OPC server, the, uh, you know, the engineering software, the HMI, the web applications. Uh, they all need to be, you know, reprogrammed to know to send the password and need to have configuration files and stuff like that generated for them. So I think that's one reason vendors aren't doing it. Um, I think that it's just an example of uh, patching, uh, you know, uh, a design problem late in the game is just too hard to do. Just because once you have this insecure by design issue, uh, it contaminates everything that has to communicate with it. Um, so uh, I, I already talked about this, uh, how the Codices version 2 application works. It's literally code injection, uh, you know, with administration privileges and no authentication. Uh, exploitation really just is learning how it works. Um, so the yeah, like I said, the you know component design problems are contamination. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, kind of in the industrial world, we have a lot of examples of these insecure by design protocols. Uh, one of the classic protocols in the space is the Modbus protocol, which is uh, industrial protocol that lets you read status and and write uh, status to a PLC. And you could actually add security to it. You could add some password mechanism or something like that to it. But just like with this code assist protocol, you know, if you do that, you now have to update all of the software that speaks that protocol to understand uh, how, how to do it. And that would be almost all of the industrial software on the planet, uh, which is probably not going to happen. Um, so for code assist version three, the protocol is a lot different from version two. Uh, remember the version two protocol just had the, the two bytes that were BBBB, then the length field, then the function code. Uh, version 3 was a lot different. Um, it can use UDP or TCP. Uh, the UDP protocol definitely limits the attack surface. Uh, I don't know about the TCP version of it yet because I haven't played with it. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the version 3 kind of in depth now. Uh, I should say that my what the what terms I use for the protocol description probably aren't going to match what 3S software uses because there's no public documentation uh, on the protocol. So just figuring out how the protocol worked is entirely reverse engineering. Um, so when you first connect with a Codasys version 3 protocol, um, you have to send uh, this connection packet. So this is from the master device to the slave device. And this is uh, just representing the data payload of the, the UDP packet. Um, the kind of interesting parts of the packet are that you actually put a part uh, one to two bytes of the IP address of both the source and the destination inside of the UDP payload, which is really weird. Um, so in this example, this is this uh, E6 and 1E. So in this case, the, the master system had this IP address. So it's the last octet of the IP address goes in this field. Um, the source address, you know, the last octet of the source address goes in this field. I think this will work for slash 16 networks and that this, these two uh, bytes, 00E6 and 001E, uh, are part of the address. Uh, another weird part of the packet is this CRC uh, algorithm. Um, and it took a little bit of work to figure out how the CRC algorithm worked. Uh, and then there's also a random nonce that's placed inside of the initial connection packet. Uh, the slave responds with a packet that looks like this. Uh, it puts the, the, um, the random nonce in the packet. Uh, so this is that random nonce replied back to the master. This is the CRC of the packet. But it, and you notice that the uh, source and destination fields are swapped uh, in this one. So, um, and then it puts this session ID in here. And this is a two byte session ID in the response packet. Uh, so the, the PLC generates this session ID. Um, so uh, then when, once the session is established, so this is kind of like doing TCP over UDP because it has this concept of sessions. Um, the, um, we always put that session ID back up here in this field um, and that session identifier never changes. 
And then we, uh, we have a couple of other numbers that we place in a packet. So this is a master uh, sequence number. So this would be like a TCP sequence number. Uh, and this is the slave sequence number. So kind of like another uh, ACK sequence number or something. Um, and then we have a length field and the CRC. Um, so uh, the security of this uh, whole system depends entirely on this session identifier, actually. Um, if, you can, if you're not on the same network as this device, um, you, you can't actually communicate directly with the PLC. But if you're not on the same network as the device and you can guess the session ID, then you can still issue commands to the PLC because you know the session number. Um, and you don't care if you can see the response or not. Um, so uh, Codasys version 3, you know, it is vulnerable, it does have all the same issues. Uh, ICS CERT published this advisory, this is from the, the ICS CERT advisory that I showed the link to before about version 2. They specifically said version 3.x is not affected by these vulnerabilities. Uh, sadly it is. Um, ICS CERT actually, it's, it's kind of unfortunate, they get information from vendors. So in this case, 3S Software said, yes, that problem affects version 2. Uh, version 3 is not affected, and ICS CERT just publishes what the vendor says without uh, doing any kind of uh, corroboration of the data. Um, so uh, 3S Software, of course, added some confusion to the whole thing. Uh, this is their official advisory for the version 2 problem. They said version 2.3 is affected, but there's also a version 2.4 that is affected by the issue, um, and version 3 is affected, so they kind of left those parts out of their advisory. It's a bit unfortunate to see this sort of thing because, uh, you know, Codasys or 3S software should know that their software all works the same and doesn't have authentication, and I just wish they would be honest. Um, at least they're, you know, they, they tell people that uh, only OEMs uh, can produce this patch. You know, you can't download an update from 3S software. You have to download it from your manufacturer, so Festo or ABB or, or whoever your vendor is. Um, so uh, lessons to learn from the, the whole uh, problem with uh, uh, vulnerability announcements was, uh, I say, trust but verify. Uh, so ask a vendor to see uh, some documentation that, first of all, they've done security testing of their, their library that you're buying, but uh, don't always believe them because, uh, in this case, uh, 3S Software, I don't like to use the word lies, but that's what they did. Um, so some affected vendors. Um, first, uh, we have the Hitachi EHV Plus line. Um, so this runs Codasys version 3. It's, it's kind of funny, I actually bought this PLC, I live in the United States, I bought this PLC from the Netherlands because you can't buy it from any resellers in the United States. Uh, so I bought it from a small control systems vendor here in the Netherlands. Um, I bought it uh, in 2014, uh, like last summer. So we tested the EHV CPU 1025, uh, if you want to look it up. Uh, it only speaks the UDP version of the Codasys protocol, which is why I haven't tested the uh, TCP for version 3. Um, the command line is disabled uh, on this PLC. It might be possible to enable it. There's a configuration file that we can download and upload to the device. And I've tried to enable it that way, and it doesn't work. But maybe there's some trick I'm not seeing. Um, First, I should say that they did a few things right. Uh, they, their PLC, they didn't give in to the peer pressure. Uh, a lot of these PLCs, they, uh, the vendors throw in the kitchen sink with their PLC, which means they add an embedded web server, they add an FTP server, they just throw a bunch of junk into the PLC because it's what their end users want. Uh, Hitachi didn't do that, so the PLC actually only runs the code assist server by default. You could enable some other protocols uh, if you pay for it, but. Uh, uh, they don't leave them open by default. Um, so they actually have a much smaller attack surface than most PLCs we look at. Uh, on the downside, there's no mechanism for updating the firmware in this PLC. So it's got this insecure by design issue and it's gonna have it forever. Um, I haven't fully reversed engineered the firmware to be sure that they can't update it, but that's, it's pretty much the case that they can't, um, uh, just based on hardware analysis and kind of how they architected the system. Um, so the exploiting the UDP protocol, remember I said that there's a two-byte session ID. On the Codasys product, that session ID is sequential. So when you first connect to it, the session ID is zero. The next time you connect to it, the session ID is four. It actually increments by four each time. So if you're an attacker and you want to guess the session ID, always guess a number divisible by four. Um, 
and you only have 16,000 possible session IDs, so you only need to send uh, a maximum of 16,000 uh, session packets and attack packets in order to stop process control of one of these PLCs if you can't actually talk to it directly. Um, there's no mechanism for adding a password even in the, the Codasys engineering software um, uh, for the Hitachi PLC, so again, this is one of those things that they're never gonna fix, I'm sure. Um, unless they produce a new version of the hardware. Um, so we, we wrote some exploit scripts for this, so we can start and stop the, P, the CPU, we can retrieve the process logic, uh, we can send a new configuration file, and we can change the device IP address all via this unauthenticated protocol. Um, so kind of an example of the problem with attacking UDP. Um, so if you're an attacker and you're on a different network than the controller, um, it, you know, you're going through a router and the controller, you can't have direct communications with the controller, you can only talk to it through the router. You can send a request session um, uh, packet to the controller. Uh, remember that source address is part of the, the UDP payload. The Codasys PLC then is gonna try to reply to a computer on the local network. So it's gonna send the session ID to some computer. The computer might exist, it might not. If you guessed an IP address of something that doesn't live on that network, uh, it will send this UDP packet to a non-existent machine. Um, but who cares? You just guess the session ID and then issue the stop command and the, the, the CPU stops. So that's kind of what we tested. Um, so another uh, vendor that we looked at, this is a, a version two uh, vendor, is the Sanyodenki San Motion C. Um, so this one runs Codasys version 2, it runs VxWorks, it even has that uh, really old VxWorks uh, debugger service. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that one. Uh, it was, uh, it's about 10 years old now, um, pretty bad vulnerability. It also had some backdoor accounts in it. So this is a picture of the San Motion C controller. Um, uh, I was originally thinking I would buy one of these, but I already had one of these. Um, it turns out that uh, there are a couple of different vendors that use the same hardware platform. Uh, Festo, I think they're a German company that makes this one. So I, I owned this PLC already. Um, and I was doing some more Googling uh, and found the Keba CP232. And if we, it's probably pretty hard to read, but that actually says CP232 slash Z on the CPU module. And this is on the Sandmotion C model. Um, and that's actually the name of the cable model. Um, I pulled the firmware off of this controller and it turns out, uh, you know, if you look at the, the comments uh, in the firmware, um, there are a whole bunch of manufacturers that use the same hardware and firmware platform. Uh, we identified a whole bunch of vendors. I think there were 12 or 13 total that use this same exact piece of hardware and software. Um, Festo and Sanyo, you know, they use the same OEM, and I think it's Keba. I think that's who actually manufactures this. They're, in, uh, they're an Austrian company, um, but there's a couple of other names there. KUKA, Trumpf, Hytayan, Bueller, Dwer, Engel. There were a bunch of other vendors. Um, they have a ton of software components in this control platform. Uh, they run VxWorks, they have Codasys, they use the CAN open protocol stack. A lot of these are used for controlling robotic arms, for like bending sheet metal. Um, but they're also used uh, sometimes for air conditioning systems. We've seen them in a couple of other places too. Um, so all the version two problems exist in this line of controller. Uh, we first contacted Festo via using ICS cert uh, in 2013. Uh, an advisory came out in 2014. Festo said, we're not gonna fix it. Like we acknowledge that those are problems, but uh, we don't plan to ever update this controller ever. Um, the controller also had, I mentioned, this VxWorks debugging service. So this was CVE 2005, that's a pretty old one, uh, 3804. So it's basically a listening service that lets you uh, debug the application that's running on the PLC. It actually lets you debug the whole operating system. So you can read and write any memory uh, in the device. Um, so that one's pretty bad. Uh, when these products were released was around 2010. So that VxWorks thing was a pretty well-known issue. There was a Metasploit module for it in like 2005 or 2006. Um, yeah, so they should have known about it. Uh, of course, they also added a backdoor FTP account, which gives you read and write uh, ability to the firmware of the device. They also left a couple of different TCP and UDP ports open for debugging the CAN bus protocol, uh, the, the CAN open stack. So you can issue direct CAN messages to a robotic arm, for example. Um, so of the nine companies that we spotted, 
as being as using the same exact hardware platform, uh, none of them spotted any of these security problems. Um, Probably none of the companies do any kind of internal or external red team testing. Uh, we don't know if these companies even share information with each other. Uh, I tried to talk to some people at Sanyo Denki, but they wouldn't talk to me uh, after contacting them about the Festo issue. Um, but I don't know. See, Festo now is at least aware that they have these problems, but I don't know if they turn around to Keba and say, hey, Keba, these problems affect everybody that uses this platform. I, I just don't know. And you know that makes me wonder, do they share information about hardware defects with each other either? And again, who knows? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the Netherlands specifically uh, as it relates to these controllers. Um, I shared a, a scanning script for these Codasys uh, protocols with John Matherly. He runs the Shodan search engine uh, or sometime in 2014. Um, you can actually now search for affected controllers uh, on Shodan. Uh, if you search uh, with this string, uh, country nl3s-smart, you'll find the, all of the codices controllers in the Netherlands uh, that Shodan is aware of. There's, so last week when I wrote this presentation, there were 50 of these devices on, in the Netherlands. Now there are 68 as of this morning. Um, so this number has actually been going up with time. Um, uh, most of the ones that I can identify what they are are running HVAC systems for large, uh, you know, large buildings. Like I, I, I don't know if this hotel is one of them. I doubt it, but, but it would be something like this. Um, I did find one navigation and engine controller that was on board one of the public ferries in the Netherlands. So think about that next time you get on a boat. Um, <laughs> um, but that one's actually been, it, it's been removed from the internet, but we're not sure how. Uh, we did contact the, the ferry operator. Um, they weren't able to locate the device, um, but uh, they, it has disappeared from the internet at least. Um, but most of the devices, we don't know what they're actually used for, right? They're just sitting out on the internet running something, but we, we can't figure out what they are. I mean, we probably could if we were bad people, but we can't do it uh, just by issuing a uh, you know, general give me whatever uh, safe data you can command to the controller. Um, so on scanning for systems, uh, Aaron Leverett is, is a really neat guy, and if you have a chance to see one of his talks, I highly recommend it. He, uh, we published a paper together when we scanned the internet for the version two controllers uh, back in 2013. Um, he, he had this great metric, which was how much does it cost to find vulnerable devices. Uh, in 2013, we found 600 codices controllers on, on the entire internet. Um, uh, it took us a while to scan for it. Shodan was still relatively new. Uh, it, we couldn't get John Matherly to, to accept our scripts at the time. He didn't have a mechanism for that. So we just ran, in fact, MassScan and ZMap and these other nice tools weren't out back then. So we had to use the unicorn scanner, which was buggy and horrible, plus Nmap to scan the internet. Um, we found 600 devices. Uh, so given the cost of our uh, virtual private servers that we used and plus the time it took us to massage the data, that came out to be about a dollar or one euro 30 for each device that we found. Um, in 2015, I can just pay 17 euros to get access to Shodan and run a search that takes me literally no time. And so now we find them for one euro cent per, per device discovered. And there's actually a lot more devices now. Um, the hardest part for us has always been, what do we do with these, these uh, device lists once we have them? Um, you know, we, we tried contacting certs and incident response teams, but usually they don't have any authority to do anything with an IP address list. Uh, you can say like, hey, the, you know, there's this PLC, it's vulnerable, it's at this IP address, but um, they can't, legally, they don't have any authority to do anything. They might have some friends at the ISP they might get in touch with, um, but they can't like force anyone to take action. Um, most of the ISPs uh, can't, can't do anything either, right? They don't want to forward security advisories to their clients. Um, uh, they worry, sometimes they worry about uh, liability, like if we do it this time, we have to do it all the time, otherwise maybe some of our clients will sue us if they get hacked. Um, you know, plus it's just a lot of work, right? If you're a security guy at a major ISP, you've got a lot to do just to protect your own equipment, not, you don't have enough time to spend uh, protecting your, your end user's equipment. Um, really rarely we can find the device owner itself, uh, but as with the ferry example, you know, they were like, yes, that's ours, but we don't know where it is or what it does or, you know, how it's connected to the internet, so we don't know how to secure it. 
Um, so um, I guess you know, the conclusions from all this is uh, vendors really need to work harder to you know, identify these security issues before their products are released. Uh, and that counts both the OEM, 3S software in this case, as well as like the, the vendor who makes the PLC. Uh, so really, like the vendors who make things like PLCs need to internally build a list of all the third-party software that they run. Um, you know, I, I used to work for a vendor for a while, uh, Schweitzer Engineering, actually. Uh, they make digital relays for a lot of substations in the United States, and we, we did this internally where we built lists of all of the, the external software that we used and, you know, kept track of what versions we had on each product. So when major vulnerabilities came out, we would know whether we were affected, and then we could, you know, produce patches of the firmware. Um, so in the San Yodenki case, right, obviously this controller was released in 2010, five years after VxWorks was well known. Uh, in the Hitachi case, uh, you know, they're, they're actually their EHV Plus line was released before the version 2 vulnerability was known in Codasys. Um, I think it was, it couldn't find an exact date. You know, we found some vague, vague press releases that started coming out around June of 2010. But really, I mean, they're a big company. They should have an internal security team. They should have noticed this. Um, and finally, you know, th these companies need to plan on patching their devices. Uh, a lot of these uh, industrial embedded controllers just don't have firmware up update mechanisms. Sometimes they use, you know, programmable read-only memory that you can only program once. You know, I've seen devices that have uh, ultraviolet erasable programmable memory. So you have to pull the board out and expose it to ultraviolet light to erase the firmware and then load new firmware into it. It's pretty terrible. Um, uh, and they really need to focus on the secure by design because uh, genuine bugs are pretty easy to patch. You know, there's no API change, there's no protocol change, but these design issues are, are pretty terrible. Um, and design problems are still like the, the major problem for ICS uh, systems. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm finished uh, with what I have to say. I wonder if there are questions. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, how do you... Um, how do you deal with the fact that there might be systems connected to the internet which are vulnerable uh, and yet we publish information about how to exploit those vulnerabilities and, and how to search for those vulnerabilities? Um, I think this question came up a lot uh, over the years because we've, we've released a lot of vulnerability information from our internal research projects. We did a project called Project Basecamp that highlighted vulnerabilities in, in a lot of different PLCs. Um, and the question comes up again and again. And, and my answer to the question really is, um, everybody, at least in the industrial space, has known that these are problems. Um, that, you know, they know that their, their products are insecure by design. Um, no, nobody really liked to talk about it much. Um, but I think by not talking about it, we were doing ourselves a disservice um, and, and not trying to um, to push things forward. I, I think, uh, you know, I did originally contact Codasys and they said, oh, that's not a vulnerability. And then we finally, you know, went through this disclosure process and things got kind of ugly. Um, but um, yeah, I, it's something that I worry about. It is. Um, so far though, you know, we haven't seen anybody actually attacking these systems, which has been a good thing, right? There are tons of uh, big HVAC systems on the internet. Um, uh, I guess my, my real answer is, at least now we know about the vulnerability and we know how to detect the attack. Uh, so the people that need to protect themselves from it can. Um, by not publishing any information about it, uh, you know, we're just keeping it quiet and then nobody even knows that they have a problem. Hope, hope that's an answer. One more question? No one? So the question is, how do we think we can get vendors to improve their security policy? Um, that I wish I knew the answer to. Uh, we've, been trying, we've been trying a lot of different ways. Um, you know, sometimes we have to do this kind of public shaming thing, unfortunately. Um, um, I think that they're, they're, get, they're coming around, though. I think part of it has just been you know, the increasing concern in the public uh, about the issue. Um, so I think... As end users, you just have to ask your vendor, like, show me your documentation that says you're following, you know, a security development lifecycle internally. Um, and like I said, trust but verify. Just because they say they're doing it, you know, make sure that they're doing it. Yeah. Have somebody review their code if it's possible. Some of these vendors are pretty willing to share their source code. Um, 
or you know, hire somebody to pen test the system and, and find these kinds of bugs.